Thanks. I was trying to use Indiana Center's YouTube account. I have to use my own, I guess. You know, you should, you should also. I was trying to use Indiana Center's YouTube account there. If that okay, doesn't well, work. I've got you in a, a live stream right now. And um, what we can do is share that. <coughs> My phone's trying to help me out. It heard me say something. Um, so, Terry, I'm ready whenever you are. Josh, are you ready? Yes. Okay, well. I guess, uh, can I uh, admit all? Uh, sure. I'll do it. Uh, I think I did already. I just clicked on admit all. Okay. Um, so, I'm glad that you put it live on YouTube, Terry, too. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, I think we're ready. And are we recording now, Terry? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana voice for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. We'll have a little bit of time later in the hour for a few questions uh, for Josh. Uh, those of you on Zoom, because of some Zoom bombing experiences we've uh, had, we're uh, um, asking that you not activate your camera or mic. That's why we don't have a gallery view right now. But if you do want to ask a question, we certainly want to welcome your questions. If you do have a question for Josh, simply click on the chat function at the bottom of the screen, submit your question there, and I'll do my best to make sure that they're... Uh, that we asked Josh your question. Josh, your question. We're kicking off a three week series today, Voices of Justice, Human Rights and Moral Revival. So we're delighted to speak with scholar, author, activist, Josh Rubner. I'll say more about uh, uh, our other speakers uh, as we wrap up today. As many of you know, Josh teaches Middle East studies at Georgetown University and presently serves as Managing Director for American Muslims for Palestine. He also served as the National Policy Director for the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. Josh, welcome. Uh, many of your friends here online want to know how you and your family are doing during this pandemic. Can you say a word about how you're all faring? Yeah, thank you very much, Michael, for that kind introduction. And I really, really appreciate the opportunity to be with you and with everyone via Zoom today. I'm really sorry that we didn't get the opportunity to do this event in person in Fort Wayne, uh, as we had planned earlier. But I'm very glad that everyone was able to take time out of their schedules to meet <laughs> uh, I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. I appreciate you for asking that. Family's doing well. Uh, and I hope that everyone on the call is doing well and is healthy as well. Good, good. Now you're talking to us from Washington, D.C., correctly? Yes. Um, okay, let's get right into it, uh, Josh. Uh, Secretary of State Mon Mike Pompeo was recently in Israel, in fact, just uh, uh, in the last couple of days, meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu to give, uh, what, uh, tacit approval to Israel's plan to annex uh, large swaths of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and uh, the fertile Jordan Valley. Yet nearly nary a word from our elected representatives, except, uh, except uh, Josh, you mentioned recently in an article, a letter written by Senators Murphy, Kane, and Van Hollen that very tepidly, but importantly, opposed annexation. Can you, can you say a little bit more about the letter and any other US opposition to Israel's annexation plan, or for that matter, any other international uh, opposition to the annexation plan? 
Sure, that's a really important question, Michael. And I think we should back up a step before we get into the specifics of the recent letter that you mentioned. Of course, in January of this year, Donald Trump finally released his uh, plan. I won't dignify it with the term peace plan, but plan for the future of Israeli-Palestinian relations. And of course, in that plan, what he did was to green light Israel's annexation of whatever West Bank lands that it wanted. So the maps that were uh, part of Trump's plan envisioned Israel annexing all of its main settlement blocks and all of the Jordan Valley, roughly about 30% of the West Bank, in order to maximize the amount of land that it could annex, while at the same time minimizing the number of Palestinians uh, who would be in this annexed land. Uh, this has always been Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's dream to establish a greater Israel that went well beyond its, its armistice lines of 1949 and to uh, encapsulate as much of the occupied Palestinian territories as is possible with a minimum number of Palestinians in it, which has really always been the Zionist project since the 19th century. Absolutely. So, after Trump released his plan in January, in February, the United States and Israel formed a joint committee to agree upon what lands Israel would be allowed to annex with the explicit approval of the United States. And this committee has been meeting very frequently to map it out. The US side is led by US Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, who was of course one of Trump's attorneys before coming into this position and is an avid, avid supporter of Israel's colonization movement in the Palestinian West Bank. So the fix is really in, and it's really a once in a lifetime opportunity for Netanyahu to achieve his greater Israel ideology and see it to fruition because he's never ever going to get another US administration which so explicitly lacks Israel's annexation of the Palestinian West Bank. So you have the reality that Netanyahu has decided to throw in his lots with the GOP. He doesn't care what the Democrats have to say, even if they are a majority. He decided to throw in his lot with the GOP when he decided a few years ago during the Obama administration to go behind the back of the president and conspire with leaders in Congress at the time, John Boehner, who was Speaker of the House, to deliver an address to Congress that sought to undercut the president's premier foreign policy achievement, which was, of course, the JCPOA with Iran, the nuclear accord that was signed and was later uh, unsigned uh, by, by the Trump administration. So Netanyahu knows that he'll never get a better president than the one he currently has in order to achieve this dream of annexation. So the coalition agreement that he signed with his electoral rival, Benny Gantz, which finally broke this logjam of more than a year of paralysis in Israeli domestic politics, could allow for a vote on annexation as soon as July 1st. So the gears are definitely in motion to annex this well before the uh, elections take place this November and present whoever's in the White House in 2021, if it's not Trump, with a fait accompli regarding annexation. So it's within that broader context that Democrats have been putting up some degree of opposition to these plans for Israeli annexation. Last December, I think it was, the House passed a resolution, I forget the, the number offhand, I think it was maybe HRS 326, which explicitly uh, warned Israel against annexing Palestinian lands, but really didn't deliver any consequences, meaningful consequences, should Israel do this. Yeah, the, same type of thing, yeah. the same type of thing is happening now in the Senate with a letter led by Senator Chris Murphy, Senator Tim Kaine, Senator Chris Van Hollen. Initially, there were some okay things about the letter. Initially, the letter said, well, Israel, you might lose US support for military aid if you annex Palestinian land. And you might lose democratic support irretrievably. But under your fellow senators and probably pro-Israel groups as well, they went back on that original language and made it even more bland than it was before. So it's really a big 
fat nothing burger right now, unfortunately. Yeah, and you even mentioned, and of course we know this, but uh, a number of the Democratic senators like uh, Ben Cardin, for example, from Maryland. I mean, my gosh, he's, uh, he now he wouldn't support the letter, but he's been all in, right, with Israel, uh, one of Israel's most ardent supporters in the Senate. Yeah, absolutely. And it's important to remember that in the last Congress, Ben Cardin, the senator from Maryland, introduced legislation that would criminalize acts of boycotting for Palestinian rights. He introduced the Israel Anti-Boycott Act, which was yeah. sponsored by many other U.S. senators and seemed poised to pass before the ACLU jumped all over it because it would imprison people for up to 20 years and fine the million dollars if they coordinated with an international organization to promote a boycott of uh, Israeli settlement products, for example. Which well, and, and for example, I mean, our, our own Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. I mean, we support BDS and we've supported Omar Barghouti and others. I mean, we would be liable. That's what you're saying, correct? I mean, uh, myself and, and an organization like ours, yes or no? Not, not exactly. Under, under the legislation, it was narrow. You had to actively co coordinate and collaborate with an international organization like the UN or like the EU uh, to promote the boycott of Israeli goods or even Israeli settlement goods. Uh, so this was at a time when the UN was constructing this database of corporations that were complicit in and profiting from Israeli, illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank. So the idea was that if you provided information to the EU or to the UN, I'm sorry, to help them with their database of settlement products, you could, yes, you could be held liable under this law and face prison time. Fortunately, it was, it was defeated. It was not passed. But this is the type of uh, mentality that senators like Ben Cardin have, which is to protect Israel at all costs. And actually, just today, I saw that he released another letter, this one to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, demanding him to uh, criticize the International Criminal Court even more so than the Trump administration has done. Wow because the ICC is now investigating Israel over its potential crimes against the Palestinian people. We have a, a, a question, a, a follow-up from our friend Cliff Bennett uh, asking about, well, what's, if all this is true, what's the Palestinian response to the annexation? What can Palestinians do to respond? Well, I think that when we're talking about the formal response from the PLO, from the Palestinian Authority, they've been unequivocal that they're obviously opposed to Israeli annexation. I think the real question will arise as to what happens the day after annexation. Will the PLO determine upon a different course not to pursue a two-state resolution since obviously annexation closes off the possibility of any realistic two-state solution permanently? And it's not reversible. Because you know, think about the history of Israeli land grabs. The land that Israel grabbed in 1948 during the Nakba and during its establishment uh, was much more than was allotted to it under the 1947 UN partition plan. The 1949 armistice lines, Israel would never go back to what was proposed by the UN in 1947. Just as Israel occupied the West Bank in 1967, there's no way it's going back to those lines either. So as East Jerusalem has been annexed, as the Syrian Golan Heights have been annexed, whatever gets annexed of the West Bank, potentially in July, is not going to be relinquished in the future. It's over. So that really raises an important question for the future of Palestinian politics, whether to give up on the two-state paradigm and revert to the initial PLO paradigm that prevailed in the 1960s and the 1970s of supporting one a democratic state based on equality between Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, we'll have to see whether an active annexation causes the active collapse of the Palestinian Authority, something that has been warned against uh, by analysts for many, many years. It could very well trigger uh, that type of dismantling of the PA, or it's just withering away. I have, uh, I have another one of my questions, Josh, but I want to try to fold in some of the questions that they have been asked now on, uh, on the chat. 
and I appreciate everybody's participation. So let me ask it this way. Uh, there are 7 million, give or take, Palestinians uh, um, between, between uh, uh, um, the Jordan River and uh, the Mediterranean, give or take. Mm -hmm. um, given that this is sort of Israel's end game, you know, annexing as much of the Palestinian land as possible with the least amount of Palestinians. What would a, what would the uh, third intifada uh, look like, or what would a, what would an end game look like? Is it a multi a multi leveled end game? Uh, is it embracing the one democratic state solution? How does that to get to be globally engaged? How does boycott, divestment, and sanctions? How, how does that play into? It? In other words, what would be a multi-leveled response to Israel's end game look like from the Palestinians' perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, and I think I, I know it's a complicated question, and it, it, it is a complicated. Layers, so, yeah, forgive me, but I'm, I'm folding in a number of the questions that our folks have had here. Yeah, that was a that was a good job of amalgamating some of them, uh, <laughs> and it's a. Uh, it's a very apropos question, especially today, as we consider the fact that 72 years ago today, Israel declared its independence. Well, and I was going to say, uh, I, uh, I, was, I was remiss in not mentioning that we're, we're commemorating, sadly and tragically, this week, the Nakba, and in two weeks, the second anniversary of the Great March of Return. So th these days are very impactful and important for our Palestinian friends, but also for those of us who stand in solidarity with them. And I, I should have said something about that right up front. So thanks for reminding us. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it is it is a very apropos day to have this conversation because as you mentioned, not only is today the, the anniversary of Israel's founding in 1948, but tomorrow is what Palestinians mark as the Nakba, the catastrophe, the dismantlement of Palestinian society uh, upon Israel's creation, the deliberate ethnic cleansing that Israel undertook of the Palestinians in 1948 to establish a quote unquote Jewish state with a majority of its inhabitants who are Jewish. And it's important to remember that when the UN passed its partition plan back in 1947, and by the way, that was only a general assembly recommendation. That was not a security council resolution that has the force of the law. It was a general assembly resolution which granted the Jewish state 55% of Palestine with 45% going to the indigenous Palestinian population when at the time the Jewish population of Palestine was only one third of the population and the Zionist movement own, owned only 7% of the land of Palestine. So these imbalanced demographics that pertained when the UN recommended that Palestine be partitioned into two back 70 more than 70 years ago, still pertains today. Because you talk about the 7 million, I, I, think, I think that's a, a rough estimate of the number of Palestinians who live today in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Gaza, and within Israel as second-class citizens of that state. Plus you take into consideration the number of Palestinian refugees and the Palestinian diaspora community worldwide and the same demographic imbalance that you had in 1947 of roughly two indigenous Palestinian Muslims and Christians for every one Jewish person is the same percentage that exists demographically today between Palestinians worldwide and Israeli Jews today. So the dilemma, the conundrum of trying to establish a Jewish state for a majority of a minority of people, excuse me, against the wills of against the will of the majority indigenous population is still the exact same problem that persists today. So Israel's annexation, I think, of the West Bank, I think honestly would be a good thing in many respects. And I'll tell you why. You know, you're, not the, you're not the only commentator. I didn't give you and Levy just say the same thing. I mean he uh, something very, very similar. And so I'm really interested in, in this particular view of yours. This is really, it's almost counterintuitive in a way, but, but so I'm, I'm glad that you're bringing this up. So forgive me for interrupting, but this is really wow. strikes right at the heart of the argument, I think. Please go ahead. Look, I'll tell you why I'm in favor of Israel going ahead and annexing. The reason why is because Israel has de facto annexed these Palestinian lands a long, long time ago. 
And the fact that they have not de jure, uh, you know, annexed these lands, uh, you know, in law has actually served as a stumbling block for a peaceful and just resolution. Because as long as Israel only de facto has annexed these lands, then we still have the mirage and the illusion of a potential two-state solution being agreed upon at some indefinite point in the future as Israel continues to grab more and more land and colonize that. So what Israel's annexation would do would be to provide a lot of clarity. It would be an inflection point. It would be a wake-up call to people around the world who have sort of hidden behind the facade and the mirage of the possibility of a sovereign Palestinian state emerging, which was, of course, never Israel's intention to allow, to enable a more realistic assessment of the politics between Israel and the Palestinian people. And it would, it would uh, drop the scales from people's eyes and, and I think uh, really make many, many people around the world aware that Israel is an apartheid state and has always been an apartheid state in terms of its policies toward the Palestinian people since 1948. And because you would then have that clarity I think you would then have a clearer path to a just and peaceful resolution of the issue, discarding the decades of outmoded and stale paradigms for trying to enforce some kind of two-state resolution where Israel does not have any interest in seeing an independent and viable and sovereign Palestinian state. It will clarify the situation. And, you know, look, as a person in the United States, it's not for me to say how Israel and the Palestinians should work out their issues. That's, that's, not, that's not my call. But as a person of conscience, as someone who backs the Palestinian Civil Society call for BDS, I understand that this is an issue of rights and not of resolutions, right? I'm gonna continue advocating for Palestinian rights until Palestinian refugees achieve justice, until they're allowed to return to their homes. I'm going to continue to engage in BDS until Palestinian citizens of Israel have full equality. And I'm going to continue to advocate for BDS until Palestinians are not militarily occupied in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And whatever works itself out in terms of an actual solution is, is really not my call to make. But obviously, I think things are headed in a particular direction. I have another, it's a little longer of a question. It's, <clears throat> it's based on one of the articles you see, uh, you recently wrote. And so let me just be patient with me as I tease this out a little bit, Josh. Sure. Uh, I thought you wrote rather persuasively uh, about the Zionist views of the uh, presumptive Democratic nominee, Joe Biden. I'm going to quote now, you said his, quote, commitment to Israel is a mixture of filial piety and a willingness to turn the blind eye to Israel's oppression as a way to assuage his guilty conscience over Christian anti-Semitism. So you said that, and then yet at the end of your essay, you suggest, and it's ever so tentatively, that perhaps he's, quote, a shape-shifting, unprincipled politician who might be willing to, quote, flip-flop on Israel and the Palestinian people if he feels the pressure to do so from the base of his party and a growing contingent of Democratic members of Congress pushing for change. Now, I recently read an interview too with Noam Chomsky who said that it's imperative to elect Joe Biden, A, and then even though his career has been a pro-Israel uh, hawk, B, and I'm paraphrasing, we should work like hell to hold his feet to the fire on Palestinian rights. So this was a long statement, Josh, but it sounds like the two of you are sort of in agreement, but so couched in my, in this long uh, statement is a question for you to elaborate a little bit more about Joe Biden as a politician and how you might encourage us as citizen activists to hold his feet to the fire. Did, th did that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I do, I do think that Joe Biden is a politician without a coherent set of political and ideological principles that underlie and undergird 
uh, his policies that he's promoting. Uh, I think you see this very clearly play itself out in the Democratic primary process where he was attacking uh, or certainly opposed to Senator Bernie Sanders and Senator Elizabeth Warren in terms of their policies. But as soon as they drop out, he tries to appropriate their language. And now he's bringing Sanders people in to form joint committees to deal with policy proposals. So on the one hand, you could look at this as a negative, as saying that he's unprincipled, which I think is the case. On the other hand, you could look at this as a positive and say there exists opportunity to move Joe Biden. So while I think it's true that there is an opportunity to move Joe Biden on certain policy issues, when it comes to the issue of Israel and the Palestinian people, what I wrote in the article that you cited makes me a little less sanguine about that potentiality. And the reason why is because, you know, right before that, that quote from the article, what I did was I cited a very, very interesting speech that Joe Biden gave to 2000 Jewish educators and rabbis in Detroit in 2011 when he was vice president. Talked about his dad. He talked about his dad. He talked about how when he was growing up, his dad would sit him down at the kitchen table and tell him about all of the horrific things that happened to the Jewish people in the Nazi Holocaust and how that instilled in him a lifelong desire and a commitment to protect Israel at all costs. And while I'm fully behind the first part of that, I don't think that sympathy for the Jewish people for what happened in the Holocaust or any of the other horrific persecution we've suffered over millennia translates into the right to allow Israel to oppress the Palestinian people. Uh, Joe Biden has this very old school pro-Israel mentality that harkens back to the days when the Democrats were actually the stronger party on Israel. And Republicans were the ones to be more inclined to criticize and yes, even to sanction Israel. Those days are long past. That does not hold at all. Today you have, according to every, every public opinion poll I've seen, and there are a lot of them over the past few years, more self-identified liberal Democrats sympathize with the Palestinian people over Israel by a two to one margin. 60 some percent of Democrats want to impose sanctions against Israel in order to halt its colonization of Palestinian land. And I think it was either in the same or different article I wrote, I cited another public opinion poll, which showed that if a two state resolution appeared to be not feasible, then I think it was something like 78% of all Democrats favored a one state resolution in which there would be democracy and equality between the Palestinian people and Israel and Israeli citizens, Israeli Jewish citizens. So with Joe Biden having these very old school outmoded pro-Israel instincts and emotions and decades worth of policy behind him in the Senate, he's just completely out of step with where the base of the party is. So that's certainly a negative, but it is a positive in the sense that he is looking to be receptive to where the base of the Democratic Party is in some respects. And I think that there is an opportunity to push him both before the November election and if he becomes president, certainly after before primarily through the DNC platform process in whatever form that might happen, although it's looking like it's gonna be a much scaled down process this year because of coronavirus. But there's still opportunities to do that. Uh, the Sanders campaign and the Biden campaign struck a deal where Sanders would still get all of his delegates to the platform committee. So certainly, you know, those, those delegates will be pushing for a much better uh, platform position that would be the case if they weren't there. Got a, um, a 
question to follow up on this from our buddy Steve France in DC. You know, Steve, I, I hope. Uh, I, know. Uh, uh, I think Steve's got a, an article coming out, and Steve, you'll have to remind us if it's in Mondo Ice. But uh, he wants to, wants you to speak to the potential you see for the one democratic state as a way forward for Palestinians and for Israeli Jews who support democracy and pluralism. Uh, we've we've uh, uh, interviewed here Jeff Halper and uh, Awad Abdel Fattah on their proposal for a one democratic state. And just your thoughts about this then if annexation goes forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, previously, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a couple different hats on here. Uh, Previously, I said, you know, here as an American living in the United States, that's not that's not my call to make how no, of course, Israelis and Palestinians ultimately resolve their issues. But I'm gonna put on my other hat and I'm gonna I'll get a little personal here because my dad was born in Palestine during the British mandate before there was a state of Israel. And he grew up an Israeli Jew. So I have Israeli citizenship based on he um, being being born there. So like I have, I have something to say about this as well. Uh, and, you know, although I was born in the United States, I'm an American citizen, I have that connection. And since I've come to an understanding of the fundamental issues between Israel and the Palestinian people, I've never thought that partitioning the land of Palestine into two makes sense from a historical perspective, from a demographic perspective, from a religious perspective, from a justice perspective. I think it makes more sense to figure out some format in which Palestinians and Israeli Jews can live together as equals with one not dominating the other in any way. Uh, for me, that's the more just and fair and humane uh, thing to do. It can't be acceptable to have any type of resolution to the issue that leaves out the majority of the people who are refugees, not allowed to return to their homes. Uh, there can be no, no settlement, no resolution based on that injustice taking place. So for me, even the idea of establishing a fully sovereign, viable Palestinian state in 100% of the occupied Palestinian territories is not enough to a, a, attain a just resolution to the issue, which is why I'm in favor of Israel annexing, because I think it hastens a, a, a just resolution along the lines of, of what I mentioned. I don't think that's going to be an easy process. I don't know if we'll see it happen in our lifetime, because to me, the way it comes down to right now is that the, the choices are not between one state and two states. To me, the choices right now, the policy options are between one state apartheid in which Israel dominates between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River and one state based on equality. Yeah. And I know where I come down on that. That's not, even, that's not even anything I need to think about. But I think it will be a very difficult transition. I mean, look, South Africa had some modality of apartheid rule for four centuries before they transitioned to democracy. Uh, even though apartheid was formalized in 1948, ironically, uh, in terms of our conversation. So I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how long it's going to take, um, but I do think that that is certainly shaping up to be the only fair and just solution and the only just resolution the only possible resolution that Israel has left open now that it's going ahead with annexation. Yeah, um, one of the things that Jeff Halper always cites is that you know they really need Palestinian leadership, and that's what Awad and some of their colleagues, some of the Palestinian colleagues, provides for the one democratic state. But the Palestinians always say that uh, they're afraid that there's a you know, that, that they're being suckered into uh, agreeing to the one state that's going to end up being apartheid and they're going to lose out even more. So it's uh, um, uh, uh, one of the comments here say, Palestinian, Palestinians I know still hunker down with their own independence. It's hard for them to give that up because of people like Dan Pipes, you know, uh, with the demo demographic threat, you know, more Arabs will start to seek full full citizenship 
And so this this one state will be one apartheid state, not one democratic state. And that's Palestinians uh, are rightly concerned, right? Uh, uh, that they're not uh, buying a pig in the poke, as it were. Look, I'm not going to criticize Palestinian leadership because I think that the transition of the PLO from a one state paradigm to a two state paradigm was a very, very difficult and consequential process for the PLO to undergo, starting in 1974 for sure. uh, implicitly and ending in 1988 explicitly with, with the Declaration of Independence and the implicit acceptance of the State of Israel. That was a very, very difficult thing to, for the PLO to undergo. And the PLO has obviously been firmly wedded to a two state since 1988, and it's, it's difficult to change course. It, it really is. And especially with the, the contraption, uh, I'll call it the contraption that has been established through the Oslo Accords of setting up this Palestinian authority, I really see as, as being the perfect mousetrap that Israel and the United States have built for Palestinians because they've created vested interests in the perpetuation of this Palestinian authority, um, you know, both, both economic and, and political, you know, which is why if, we're, if Israel and the United States and the international community want the Palestinian Authority to remain in place, there's a good likelihood that it's going to remain in place because of those vested interests. So, you know, it's a very, very difficult situation, but I would push back, but definitely push back on the notion that there is no Palestinian leadership. Uh, I think that we have the leadership through Palestinian civil society. There were more than 170 different Palestinian civil society groups that issued this call to action in 2005 to the international community to engage in campaigns of boycott, divestment, and sanctions to promote Israeli, uh, to promote Palestinian rights, excuse me. And that more than anything has really changed the fundamental paradigm for people around the world to understand the issue. And I think that the Palestinian led BDS movement has made really, really tremendous strides, both in terms of changing the discourse around the world and also having very significant victories in setting Israel along the path towards international pariah. So the leadership is there. It's not necessarily coming from those who are, I won't even call them elected positions because they're not elected positions. I mean, there haven't been elections in, in Palestinian politics for, for more than 15 years now. But from, from officialdom, the leadership is definitely coming from civil society. I have a number of other questions that people are asking, but I want to make sure we get this in because uh, uh, this is an important part of your life these days. You're, you're now serving as managing director for American Muslims for Palestine. And I want you to say a, 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 a word about the good work that they're doing uh, in this country and around the world, really, and uh, just your work there and some of their initiatives uh, uh, presently. Yeah, Muslims for Palestine is a really, really crucial organization within the broader Palestinian rights movement in this country. They're an organization that has deep, deep um, communal ties to both the Palestinian American Muslim community and the broader Muslim American community. And I think when you look at the reason why uh, U.S. policy is so biased toward Israel and has been for the last seven decades, it's been largely because of the um, official communal support for Israel received by Jewish institutions and organizations in this country. Of course, we see growing ex exceptions to that um, today and, and more and more Jewish Americans like me are, are, are you know, standing in solidarity with the Palestinian people. But from officialdom within the Jewish American community, that certainly hasn't the case. The reason why I bring that up is because I think it's of crucial importance that the Muslim American community, which is so demonized, so subjected to Islamophobic um, rhetoric and actions by the government, uh, is able to raise its voice on the issue of Palestine because Muslim Americans are becoming a more important voting bloc. Uh, they're getting elected to Congress, as, as we see, as well as state houses across the, the country. And so 
as Muslim Americans um, rise further and further in national politics, as Muslim Americans become a more important constituency in domestic US politics, the importance of having a strong um, Palestinian Muslim led organization organizing the Muslim community on the issue of Palestine is of critical importance to trying to sway US policy to be more balanced and to take Palestinian rights into account more. So, you know, some of the things that AMP does, for example, is that it holds the largest uh, Palestine lobby day uh, every year. This year, we were expecting probably about 750 people, mostly Palestinian Americans, but also allies as well, to come to Washington DC in late March and to hold a uh, lobby day. We had many, many meetings with senators and with representatives directly. Unfortunately, our plans were, were canceled because of coronavirus. Uh, and you know we're still waiting to see what happens and when Congress opens up and everything's just up in the air. But the point I'm trying to make is that AMP organizes the largest um, Palestine lobby day out of any group uh, every year. And that's crucially important for members of Congress to be hearing directly from their constituents who come to Washington, D.C. for that purpose. AMP does a lot of um, educational outreach. It does a lot of work to oppose what it calls faith washing, the attempt of Zionist organizations uh, you know, to co-opt and, and work with Muslim leaders in an exchange for suppressing their ability to speak out on Palestinian rights. Uh, AMP also organizes a 3,000 strong uh, person convention every year in Chicago, uh, which is sort of the unofficial capital of the Palestinian American community, and uh, is doing really great work also in terms of promoting a boycott of Israeli dates within the Muslim community, especially during the month of Ramadan, which we're in right now, uh, because a lot of Israeli dates are produced on Israeli settlements in the West Bank and are harvested by exploited Palestinian laborers on stolen Palestinian land. And so they're doing great educational work, great BDS organizing work to get the Muslim American community to boycott these Israeli dates. I uh, I had a question similar to this, but we've had three or four folks uh, want to wait, want you to weigh in on uh, uh, the EU, and the, the latest is from our friend Mark Braverman. So let me just read his question to you. Um, uh, what do you think is the importance or significance of the EU here, and what might be the actions, sanctions, diplomatic? He says the EU has a record on this with some economic moves, but not severe or well enforced. If the EU or EU nations start to escalate their activity, what might the possible effect be on US policy? And so I want you to address that. And then I'm gonna come back to the rest of Mark's question, which is my own and a number of the other people. I'll come back to it, Josh, but then we're gonna ask you about a coalition of maybe church groups here in the US, uh, uh, like FASNA, like the Kairos, USA and Kairos in uh, 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 around the world, Kairos organizations and others. So uh, address the EU and then we'll come back to the coalition of, of religious and community and grassroots organizations. Yeah, thanks. Great question, Mark, and great to hear from you. Um, it's a very, very important question. Obviously the EU could play a very crucial role and could implement significant sanctions on its own if it chose to go down that route. To date, the EU has been pretty feckless in terms of standing up to Israel and the United States, has been very, very cautious uh, in, its, in its moves in this regard. There has been in recent years a move to requiring the labeling of Israeli settlement goods as being from that origin. Uh, to me, this is like the bare minimum, the, the, the very least that the EU could do. Uh, so, and not even that's really being enforced within the EU as, as far as I understand. But it's a step in the right direction, even though it's a very, very small one. So how could the EU step this up without having to deal with the US veto in the UN State Council, which is inevitable, not just with the Trump administration, but certainly with the Biden 
hydration do in terms of imposing sanctions on Israel. Uh, the EU could move to ban outright the, sell, uh, the, the importation of Israeli goods instead of just requiring them to be labeled as such. The EU could stop funding different technical projects that they have with Israel. Uh, and most importantly, and this is something that the Palestinian BNC, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions National Committee has been advocating for, for many years, which is bilateral or multilateral arms embargoes and a cessation of the arms trade with Israel. Now this would be extremely significant because Israel's economy is reliant to a large extent on its military industrial complex. And if it loses the capability of exporting its technologies, its military uh, technologies to the EU, that would be a significant blow to Israeli economic interests. And I think it's worth noting that when we look at the history of apartheid in South Africa and how that came to an end, it was largely the result of the white capitalist class in South Africa turning against the apartheid government because BDS efforts hurt their pocketbooks so badly and made it so difficult for them to engage in any type of international business or transactions. They're the ones who really turned on the pressure uh, on their government to dismantle apartheid. Of course, that is not at all meant to discount the enormous impact that the ANC had in leading that um, freedom struggle. But certainly that was the dynamics of the politics within the white uh, Afrikaner community there in South Africa. And I think that when you look at Israel, you could foresee a similar thing happening where the capitalist class within Israeli Jewish society simply turns against its government and saying, we're hurting too much in the pocketbooks. We can't keep this up. You're killing us. We have to move towards democracy and equality. Wow. Have you said that? I mean, I don't know anybody who's really said that before. Uh, I don't know that it's original. I mean, I'm too, I'm too young to remember the, the apartheid struggle myself. No, I'm talking about how it applies to Israel because it just oh. seems that they're in lockstep, you know, uh, uh, the capitalist class and the, the government, no? Well, I mean, Come on, the capitalist class is always going to look out for their pocketbooks <laughs> and, their, and their bottom line. And so if it gets to the point where BDS has the economic impact that really, really affects their bottom line in a significant way, and, and it's starting to, I mean, don't get me wrong, like, you know, many uh, significant Israeli companies like Agrexco, for example, which is which was one of the primary uh, agricultural export exporters of uh, Israel folded as a result of Israeli, uh, as a result of Palestinian BDS pressure, uh, especially as it took place in, in the EU. So don't get me wrong, they are starting to feel the pressure. It just hasn't reached the point where they're ready to turn on their government's underlying um, philosophy of Zionism yet. Talk to, talk to us a little bit more about um, the importance the importance of, uh, of BDS, Josh, and and how us, how our community organizations, you know, uh, uh, not only direct advocacy, but uh, uh, buying patterns, uh, but for us in our, our, our community organizations and church organizations, this, this coalition I was referring to, how we can be supportive of BDS in our own context. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that the uh, mainstream Protestant denominations in the United States have already played a very, very key role in advancing BDS by passing resolutions at their annual conventions. Were you a uh, part of those conversations of, when you were at the U.S. campaign? Did you meet with uh, denominational folks? Not, not directly. That wasn't that wasn't my um, primary domain. That was more some of my other colleagues, uh, like Anna, Anna Balzer. Um, I was doing more of the political government advocacy side, but um, that's been a very, very important development. The fact that many of these denominations have already passed resolutions calling for a boycott of Israeli settlement goods, calling for divestment from U.S. companies that are profiting from Israeli military occupation. In some cases, divesting holdings from Israeli banks, for example, like the United Methodist Church did. Those are all extremely significant steps. And they've been extremely worrying to the 
government of Israel. I mean, to give you a, a, a picture of the extent to which the government of Israel is concerned about these BDS efforts in Olympia, Washington, in the last decade, there was a effort to get the local co-op to deshelve Israeli products. And there was a co-op vote that passed to that effect, just that action. And I think there were two or three Israeli products involved in this. Just that action went all the way up to the Consul General in San Francisco. Uh, and the Israeli government has instituted an entire new government ministry, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, for the sole purpose of trying to combat the global BDS movement. Because I think Israel sees the writing on the wall uh, in, in its more sober days, it does. It understands that it's a path to international uh, pariah status. It understands that the U.S. support that it gets is the only thing standing in the way of the status it enjoys now and that pariah status. Uh, and so it's very invested in trying to defeat the BDS movement. And we see the Israeli government trying to meddle in the First Amendment protected rights of Americans in all kinds of ways by spying on them. I mean, this is not this is not conspiracy or anything. I mean, the Israeli government goes out and says, we spy on people around the world in order to try to defeat the BDS movement. Uh, and we know from the leaked Al Jazeera documentary that was broadcast by Electronic Intifada, yeah, because the country government wouldn't allow it, we know that the Israeli government and the embassy is working directly with different Israel advocacy organizations to try to stifle and defeat the BDS movement. And that there's significant um, exchange of information between the Israeli foreign ministry and these organizations, which contravenes US law, by the way. The US Foreign Assistance Act says a foreign government that meddles in the internal domestic affairs of, of the United States is not eligible for any type of US funding. So when we talk about BDS, we often uh, unnecessarily kind of bifurcate our analysis and our actions. We think that, oh, BDS, is solely on the civil society tract, has nothing to do with what the US government does. But what is sanctions? Sanctions are government imposed by definition or imposed by an international organization. You as Michael Spaff can't impose a sanction on a foreign government, only, a, only another government can do that. So our role in terms of the BDS movement, in terms of our elected officials, in terms of our advocacy is to advocate for sanctions to be imposed on Israel. And the first step in that process is making sure that the United States at the very least holds Israel accountable to existing US laws that are supposed to prevent US foreign assistance from being used to commit human rights violations abroad. That's the very least we can do is to hold Israel accountable to the existing laws already. And once we do that, we can set the framework for actually a proactive sanctions regime against uh, Israel. Josh, you mentioned uh, um the military industrial complex of Israel is the kind of the heart of the of Israel's economy. You know, I'm not sure that, I mean, most of us who are on this call are activists and so we have an idea, but I want you to say a, a word about just how the tentacles of that military industrial complex reach out into all aspects of life from not only selling arms around the world, providing arms, but police training, uh, prison enforcement, surveillance, my God, surveillance and, and, and technological uh, uh, equipment and spying technology. Say a word about just all the various tentacles or spokes of the wheel of this military industrial complex. Well, look, since you had Jeff Halper on, uh, you, you heard it from the expert on this. Uh, you know, I can only um, kind of like pass on secondhand what I know from him and others who are the real experts on this issue. But yeah, as you mentioned, it goes well beyond uh, the export of, of weapons. Uh, you know, Israel, actually drones were invented in Israel in, in the 1970s. And uh, Israeli drones compete on the international market with US drones for that very, very growing segment of, of um, surveillance. Uh, you can see that type of collaboration happening where Israel is exporting its surveillance technologies um, from the wall that is created in the West Bank and the border 
fences created around the Gaza Strip and exporting that into the US domestic context. So Elbit, one of the Israeli um, military industrial corporations won a contract from the Department of Defense several years ago to install surveillance equipment along the US-Mexico border, which is actually uh, on indigenous land in, in New Mexico, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, look, it's not a conspiracy. I mean, companies who make, which make surveillance equipment, which make weapons, they sell to anyone and everyone who their government will allow them to sell to. And it's no different with the US military industrial uh, complex here. The last time I looked, Israel was the number five uh, leading exporter of military arms and surveillance equipment in the entire world. So it's a very, very advanced industry, even though there are certain things that Israel is reliant upon for the United States and its military aid in order to get, especially the things like fighter jets, um, attack helicopter gunships, tanks, things like that. Those are produced by the United States, uh, export to Israel, along with things like guided missiles and so forth. I want to return to Joe Biden again, uh, Josh. Uh, you talk about his uh, devotion to Israel as sincere and almost mystical. You know, it, it occurs to me um, that um, He's not so dissimilar to many of the folks, the, the non-Jewish folks that we out here in the heartland uh, deal with in our own context. You know, many non-Jewish folks whose, whose Zionism isn't ideological. I mean, for many it is, but, but a, lot of, a lot of folks in churches, for example, it's not so ideological as it is just a confusion between an appreciation and respect for the Judaism that they learn from their Sunday school teachers, you know, and an unreflected upon support for the state of Israel, right or wrong. And I'm wondering in your advocacy on Capitol Hill, how many, how, can, can you give a sense of the uh, ratio of ideological Zionists who are just you know, maybe because they're Christian fundamentalists or, or you know, Jewish uh, uh, Zionists, and those who just are non-ideological, unreflected upon Zionists. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's hard to quantify that, I would say. Um, Joe Biden is a self-professed Christian Zionist. Yeah. Um, his type of Christian Zionism, I think is not reflective at all of where most of the base of the Democratic Party is. I think today in the Democratic Party, most of the support you see for Israel is coming from Jewish Zionist members of Congress and not Christian ones. Uh, on the Republican side, it's, it's very different because obviously you know, the uh, very right wing um, Christian base is, is a huge part of the makeup of, of the GOP today. And you have some GOP members of Congress and people in the Trump administration who are obviously just have absolutely nothing to do with religion whatsoever, uh, trying to wrap themselves up in, in, that, in that mantle. And you know, playing to the Christian Zionist card is, is part of that charade that they play. But then there are other people like Senator Marco Rubio, who I think is very intelligent. He's a very smart guy. And uh, he knows he knows the issues really well. And you know, I think he's really an uh, ideological Christian Zionist. I mean, if you look at his Twitter feeds, for example, he's always putting out religious um, verses and, and whatnot on, on his Twitter feed. So, you know, I think that in some corners of the GOP, it's heartfelt and real and, and true. And in others, it's just a charade to get votes and to get um, campaign donations. <coughs> I I'll tell you what, though, you know, when Kufi, Christians United for Israel, 
I mean, they claim to be the largest Zionist organization in this country. I don't know. I don't know if I believe that John Hagee really has the support that he says he has in terms of tens of millions of supporters. Uh, their lobby days in, in Washington, D.C. certainly don't reflect those numbers by any stretch of the imagination. But I will just tell you anecdotally that I was up on the Hill, I think, two years ago when, when Kufi was doing their lobby day. And uh, I engaged some of their, some of their citizen lobbyists uh, you know, talking to them, I was, I was kind of playing dumb and uh, just asking them like what they were lobbying for that day. And it was pretty clear to me that they really had no firm uh, understanding of, of the politics or the, or the policies, you know, for them just being there, it was just part of their religious commitment. It really didn't have anything to do with politics and they were being used to promote a very right wing um, political agenda that certainly has nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus Christ. So you've been touching, you've been touching on this uh, uh, as we've talked throughout this hour, Josh, but um, you've spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. Uh, when, when Terry and I were in D.C. in uh, February, I mentioned to you that I always thought of Congress as occupied territory, but you offered, uh, you offered some points of hope. We talked about the letter from Murphy and the others, uh, Van Hollen and Kane uh, earlier. Um, you want to say a word about Betty McCollum's efforts and those of the squad and if and where else we can look for hope in Congress? Yeah, absolutely. I started out my professional career as an analyst in Middle East affairs for Congress, sort of serving as, the, as an analyst in the in-house think tank for Congress for policy recommendation and advice. Needless to say, they didn't take any of my advice, uh, <laughs> but that's where I started out in my career. 20 years ago, honestly, you could count on one hand uh, the number of members of Congress who were even remotely sympathetic to Palestinian rights, remotely, and even less who were willing to do something about it. In the span of a decade, that's changed quite dramatically. So 20 years ago, and this is especially evident when you look at the public opinion poll that is done consistently year in, year out by Pew, there's been a dramatic partisan shift on thinking uh, between Israel and the Palestinian people, between Republicans and Democrats over the past generation. So 20 years ago, your partisan affiliation had absolutely no predictive value in terms of how you related to Israel and the Palestinian people. Similar number of Democrats and Republicans supported Israel over the Palestinians. And those numbers, you know, there are very, very small numbers of, of those who, who sympathize with Palestinians amongst either party. That is fortunately not the case anymore today. And we've gotten to the point where there's, I think, really an irretrievable um, chasm between Democrats and Republicans on this issue. And I think this is great. I think as long as support for Israel was seen as a bipartisan consensus, there is no room on Capitol Hill to do this work for Palestinian rights. But the fact that you have the base of one party being much more sympathetic to Palestinians than to Israel, while at the same time, Republicans have become more and more ideologically in step with Israel, this has created a rift. So the way that Israel's dealt with on Capitol Hill today, it's not quite like women's reproductive health issues, but it's getting to that point in terms of a partisan divide uh, or gun control for another uh, example. I think it will get there. And I think that we can help drive that process by supporting members of Congress who are doing enormously important work on this issue, like Representative Betty McCollum of Minnesota, who was the first member of Congress ever to introduce legislation that proactively supported the Palestinian, the human rights of the Palestinian people by introducing, in this Congress it's HR 2407, which would mandate that Israel not be allowed to spend a single dollar on its detention and prosecution of Palestinian children in a separate and unequal military judicial system. It also calls for funding for the uh, emotional rehabilitation of Palestinian children who in many cases have experienced physical violence under Israeli military uh, judicial control and sometimes sadly amounting to torture. 
Uh, it's a really pathbreaking resolution. It's obviously not going to pass in, in this Congress, but I think it's um, creating the conditions to say that it's okay to come out and to support Palestinian human rights and that you're not gonna lose your seat over it. Betty McCollum is not gonna lose her seat because she's outspoken in support of Palestinian rights. In fact, she gets a lot of support from her district because of that. You know, some of us met uh, some of us met her and heard her uh, at the U.S. campaign uh, uh, meeting in St. Paul, um, and you were there and ushering her in. I think at the time, she appears. You know, when she first started speaking, she appeared to be a very genteel, uh, almost a, a lady from a, a prior era, and yet she's as tough as nails, isn't she? Uh, when it comes to not only this issue but other issues in her platform, I mean, she is really a she. She's a, she's a very principled, strong uh, force for the for ch children's rights, Palestinians' children's rights, and Palestinian rights uh, in, in general. Absolutely, and you know, of course, you mentioned the spot earlier. I think that's an incredibly important development where you have this cast of new incoming, extremely progressive um, women of color into Congress. And they're at the forefront of advocating for Palestinian rights. And when we look at the um, demographic changes within the United States and we understand how people of color um, are becoming more and more important bases of the Democratic Party and how progressive ideas are overtaking the sort of corporate centrism of the DNC of the 90s and 2000s. You know, I think the writings on the wall in terms of the future politics of Democratic members of Congress will be. Uh, I think right now we're seeing really important challenges to uh, old school Israel advocates on the Democratic side, uh, such as Representative Elliot Engel and Representative Stanley Hoyer in Maryland. They're both facing primary challenges for the first time in many, many years. And their challengers are openly castigating them for their support for Israel and openly embracing Palestinian rights because not only is that their principles, but they understand that that is what the base of the Democratic Party wants to see. So it's incredibly, incredibly important development, a promising development, I think. And let's not discount what happened during this crazy <laughs> 2020 democratic primary process. I mean, obviously none of us expected it to take place under, under conditions of quarantine. But before all the other candidates dropped out, it was exactly, Representative Lipinski was also defeated. That was uh, a, an, amazing, an amazing thing that happened in the primaries because he was a primary example of a conservative Democrat in a district with a significant Palestinian American population who nevertheless still took on the uh, pro-Israel uh, orthodoxies. And yes, he was primaried and he lost uh, in the primaries this year. So that's another great example. Thank you for mentioning that. But you know, let's also not discount what happened in the, in the Democratic primaries this year. 2016 was very important because for the first time you had a candidate, Bernie Sanders, out on the campaign trail, speaking in support of Palestinian rights and getting applause for it at democratic debates. And that was a huge marker. And that was the point when Bernie Sanders realized not only that advocating for Palestinian rights was the right thing to do, but that he was gonna get support for doing it and distinguish himself from other candidates for taking that position. So what did you see happen this year? You have Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Pete Buttigieg, who is certainly no progressive, Indiana's own, uh, <laughs> all adopt the idea of conditioning military aid to Israel as part of their platform. This, I think, is unprecedented in U.S. history. You could, yeah, you could go back to 1956 and Eisenhower's re-election, and you can say that, yeah, Eisenhower ran on that platform too because he actually sanctioned Israel a few days before his re-election in 1956 after Israel invaded Egypt, but that's another, that's another story. And that really had nothing to do with the Palestinians. But it was really unprecedented for candidates on the presidential campaign trail. And I looked this up, I said, maybe, maybe Jesse Jackson did this in 84 and 88. 
And I went back and looked at it. No, Jesse Jackson did not advocate for sanctioning Israel or conditioning military aid to Israel. In fact, the opposite. He was giving interviews saying how great of a thing it was for military aid to Israel to flow. So it was really, really unprecedented what we saw in, in the primary this year. And I really think it's a harbinger of where things are going within Democratic Party politics. Josh, I'm gonna let you have the last word, uh, uh, but before I do, but uh, I wanna condition your last word though. Uh, a, number of, uh, a number of us, uh, Steve France, uh, your friend is involved with FOSNA uh, in Washington DC, Mark Braverman, Kairos USA, our buddy uh, Fahad Abouakko from the Atlanta joining hands for justice in Palestine and Israel uh, uh, in Georgia. Uh, and a number of other folks are involved in these grassroots, religious, but also uh, more broadly community organizations. And so in your last words to us uh, in a few minutes, I want you to give us our marching orders, uh, at least in your perspective, uh, strategic action we can you know, strategic uh, uh, action that we can that we can do in our own context. But before I turn it over you to you, Josh, I want to just remind all the listeners that this is the this is the first of three interviews in our series, Voices of Justice, Human Rights, and Moral Revival. Next Wednesday, May the twentieth at two o'clock in the afternoon Eastern Time. We'll be hosting Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris of the Cairo Center in New York and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign with Reverend William Barber. I was just in touch with Liz last night. Uh, she'll be talking about the Poor People's Campaign, obviously, and especially the Poor People's Moral March on Washington, which will take place virtually now on June the 20th uh, uh, next month. So please join us. Uh, next week on Wednesday, not Thursday, Wednesday at 2 Eastern time for our conversation with uh, Reverend Dr. Liz Steele Harris. In two weeks from today, on May the 28th at 2 o'clock Eastern time, so that's two weeks from today, Thursday, May 28th, 2 o'clock Eastern time, we'll be speaking with Dr. Mustafa Barghouti from Ramallah, Secretary General of the Palestinian National Initiative Political Party a member of the Palestinian Legislative Council and founder of the Palestinian Medical Relief Society. So please share the news of the series of interviews with our friends. Uh, I'll be sending out um, uh, uh, further announcements and you can find that on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace uh, web page. We'll be getting you information about those interviews in the next week and, week and two weeks. So Josh, uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, any parting words for us? Yeah, thank you so much, Michael, for having me. I really, really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today and really appreciate everyone taking time out of their day to, to have this virtual conversation. I hope that we're able to do uh, real in-person conversations in the not too distant future. Sure. And you know, speaking of the coronavirus, to be honest, I'm having a hard time being strategic right now, just with all of the uncertainty, not knowing when we're going back to normal, if we're going back to normal. Uh, I, I think those questions have significant implications for any type of long-term strategic thinking. So I don't know if I have a really great answer uh, as to what we should be strategically doing right now. Uh, but I will say that there are many, many opportunities within your local context to be involved currently in a strategic way. So I think a lot of it depends on, on where you sit and what institutions you're a part of. If you're part of a church, I think there's a lot of work that can be done both at the local and the national level. Uh, in terms of the local level, you know, part of the problem with uh, national denominations passing these great resolutions is that it hasn't necessarily trickled down to individual churches. And I know a lot of people in individual churches have no idea what their national church denomination passes in terms of resolutions. So I think that, you know, if you're situated within, within a church context, getting your church to act upon the BDS resolutions that the national denomination has passed would be fantastic. 
you know, and that's very concrete things like making sure the HP is out of your church and that you don't buy HP products. Um, you know, making sure that if you're doing an addition to your church or what have you, you're not using Caterpillar bulldozers or the contractors aren't, for example. Um, if, that's, if that's not your institutional affiliation, I think there's a lot of work we can do at the city council level uh, to pass resolutions looking at budgetary issues. And I'm really, really glad that you're having a representative of the Poor People's Campaign join the call next week because I think that they're doing incredibly valuable intersectional work um, in this regard. And they've been challenging U.S. budgetary uh, allocations and talking about how much of the U.S. budget is devoted to warfare as opposed to the human needs of, of people who are most in need of, of help from, from the government. The same, the same U.S. campaign meeting that Betty McCollum spoke at, as you well know because you were there, uh, William Barber spoke. Uh, uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah. So yeah. The, the, the intersectionality of the, of the movements is, couldn't be clearer. Yeah. And I think, you know, the coronavirus has exposed a lot of realities about the unjust nature of U.S. society that many people had turned a blind eye to previously in terms of the inequities in terms of who's considered an essential worker and how they're paid, uh, and in terms of people's access to healthcare. I think that if there is one silver lining to the coronavirus, it's that we have the possibility to re reimagine our society and reimagine our politics for hopefully soon a post-coronavirus era. And I think that creating those type of intersectional links is going to be a very important component of the work that Palestine advocates should do because part of, you can't, you can't take apart the issue of halting military aid to Israel, weapons to Israel from the other unjust components of uh, US politics and US societies. It has to be a package. And I think the Poor People's Campaign is doing a really excellent job of making sure this is, this is dealt with in, in, in an intersectional whole. I'll say one more word because I know we're running out of time. If party politics is your cup of tea and that's something you're involved with, obviously there are huge opportunities to advocate for Palestine within, I'll, I'll just say for the sake of being nonpartisan for protecting your 501c3 status of both parties. Uh, you know, obviously, look, look, let's be realistic. Like you can advocate for Palestinian rights within the Republican party, but you probably have a more productive time banging your head against the wall. <laughs> uh, obviously, there's much, much more room within the Democratic Party to advocate for Palestinian rights than in the Republican Party uh, at, at the present. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try to advocate within the Republican Party. If you are a GOP supporter, by all means, like they could use the pressure. But, you know, where there's the, the most ability to affect change is clearly within the Democratic Party platform that will be adopted at some point this summer. And I think that that's a really crucial document. And can I, can I go on? I know we're over time. Can I go? No, over? no, 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 we're flexible. I'll, I'll just go back to the importance of this battle in 2016, because you had a situation where you had Hillary Clinton delegates to the DNC platform writing committee and Bernie Sanders delegates, and they were allotted in proportional representation to the overall vote count of the primary. So Clinton had a built in advantage. And we were, we were trying to work with both camps this is when I was working at the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights. We were trying to work with both camps to um, more forcefully advocate for Palestinian rights within the democratic platform. Bernie Sanders was pushing a platform that called for ending Israeli military occupation and calling settlements illegal, which was great. It was, it was an important thing, but it didn't go far enough. Uh, that was defeated by Hillary Clinton's team, which didn't want any, any mention of ending Israeli military occupation so explicitly in, in the platform. They preferred a more benign, we support two state formulation. What we were told by some, some delegates of Hillary Clinton to the platform writing committee, and this, this is how intense the political pressure was, was that Clinton's people told their delegates that if you voted for Sanders' platform, 
you would never have another position within the Democratic Party again for the rest of your life. That's how intense the pressure was coming from the Clinton camp. So there's going to be a similar fight this year in 2020, and um, it's imperative that Palestinian rights advocates win this battle. It wasn't for lack of trying in 2016. It was just for lack of numbers and lack of political power. But so much has changed in the intervening four years. So I think we have a real, real opportunity for the Democratic Party to, to adopt a much better platform in 2020. And if Biden is elected in November, make sure that the administration is held accountable to the platform in 2021 and beyond. You know, Josh, well, I want to say thanks to you, Josh. Uh, and um, uh, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, we were planning to have you uh, earlier this month here in Fort Wayne. And I guess uh, I don't need to encourage the rest of us, but I will, that once the pandemic eases enough for us to be meeting again in person, uh, I know Josh would appreciate invitations to come and speak personally in your various uh, localities and to your various organizations. And Josh, uh, uh, because of the ever evolving nature of our political system, we hope to have you here in Fort Wayne uh, uh, when that, when that the easing uh, occurs. So I wanna say, Josh, again, thanks to you, uh, to, to you and your family, stay safe and healthy. Thanks to all the rest of you for joining us today. And we hope to see you next Wednesday at two o'clock Eastern with Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris of the Poor People's Campaign. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>